nice day. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, can, can you describe some of this then? So, uh, on the right hand side, of course, we have the pilot seat, which is normally, is, is really the pilot, and is NASA speak for the co pilot. And on the left side, we have the commander's seat, which is NASA speak for the uh, pilot in command. And um, normally on uh, ascent and entry, you would have um, a couple seats behind there. In the middle, you would have mission specialist two, who essentially is the flight engineer helping the pilot and commander. And then to the right, you'd either have mission specialist one on ascent and mission specialist three on entry. Generally, they would swap off and uh, they would assist uh, with um, issues that the pilot commander and mission specialist two need to understand that might be required looking up in a book or something like that so uh the last time i was here before today was about 25 years ago and i came up with my family and um after about an hour and a half they want to go to the gift shop and of course i wanted to spend another couple days going through the museum so i decided i was going to have to come back by myself in the future so uh so that's why i'm one of the reasons i'm here today and what's it like to see cct1 well, I'm excited that it's still around and uh, that, you know, it didn't wind up in a junkyard somewhere, that somebody's taking care of it, maintaining it, so future generations can uh, have a good idea of uh, what the inside of a shuttle looks like, uh, where the crew lives, where they operate, what they do, and uh, certainly uh, this training aid was designed to do that for the astronauts, so it certainly does that for people who come, come by and take a look at it. I was always interested in uh, operating uh, equipment. I, I jokingly tell people, I'm a heavy equipment operator, okay, so I flew the space shuttle and so that's just heavy equipment. Yeah. I, I also do very well, by the way, on backhoes and things like that, you know. I mean, I mean, so I always wanted to operate equipment. I was excited. I was interested in tractors when I was at the youngest age. My uncle would come over and cut our fields and I would wait there on the ditch just waiting to hear the, the, the tractor come down the street, the pound, pound, pound. You could hear it long before you could see it. And um, so I've always been excited about uh, uh, equipment like that. And so, of course, airplanes got me interested. I was interested in airplanes. I studied the early test pilots. I, um, I, uh, my fifth grade teacher made a mistake of letting me do a report on a book I read about the early test pilots. It was titled X-15 Pilots. And uh, after three days, she finally concluded three. It, she would devote like a half an hour after lunch to reports on books. And after three days, she said, you know, the other kids need to have an opportunity or just, I was still reporting on the same book because I was so excited about it. Yeah, well, um, the X-15 over there still holds the speed ab ab Absolutely, it was, a, it was beautiful to see it. When I was out at Edwards, um, I got to meet uh, several pilots who flew uh, the X-15. I actually got to fly with Bill Dana, who was an X-15 pilot. And uh, of course, um, um, Joe Engel was a space shuttle pilot in addition to being an X-15 pilot. I got to fly with him. So, uh, I mean, for a kid who grew up wanting to do all that, it's like, you know, getting to go out with your favorite superhero or whatever and do an adventure with them. So it was very exciting to me. So my upbringing was I grew up on a, um, I would call it a subsistence farm in just outside Albuquerque, New Mexico. We had eight acres. You know, we had cows and chickens and we grew some vegetables and things like that, but we mainly depended upon my, job's, my dad's job. But I had a lot of chores around the house and, uh, and things like that. So I certainly developed a work ethic. My father's attitude was, you know, when we're doing something, everybody has a job to do. Everybody's helping out. Everybody's working hard. Uh, I had two brothers and two sisters. Um, and um, I was I, still very good friends with, unfortunately, we still have all of them. Uh, lost a brother at a very young age, but um, th those that uh, that made it out of childhood, we, we still have all of them. And um, so I think my parents were uh, excited that I wanted to become an astronaut. Um, I think my brothers and sisters thought it was interesting. Um, when I, I had a cousin who um, uh, thought who actually uh, made fun of me and uh, said, uh, you know, you're never going to become an astronaut. They're not going to pick somebody from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, years later, you know, like 20 years later, when I actually made it into the program, I saw him again. And he said, I always knew you would be an astronaut. So he had changed his tune a little bit. I went directly from the high school uh, into the Air Force Academy, got about 20 days off. 
uh, went, went camping with a very good friend of mine, and uh, then I headed off to the academy. The academy experience for me was uh, very intense. Um, I enjoyed the academics and I had the opportunity to join the parachute team at the academy and I, and I qualified for the parachute team. And uh, so that was a great experience for me, a very, um, it, it, the opportunity to participate in a really world-class team. We won the National Collegiate Championships every year I was at the academy. Um, also gave me the opportunity to be around aviation and um, to learn things like uh, final approach and, and um, aim point and descent rate and things like that. So you actually fly a parachute. I mean, it, it's a wing. You fly it like you fly an airplane. It just has a very different um, L over D, lift to drag ratio. But um, when I got to pilot training and um, the instructor started, started trying to talk to me about an aim point, shifting it and mechanically landing an airplane and everything, my response was, you know, I landed the airplane and the instructor was like, yeah, that's, you did everything I said, do that again. And I was like, I didn't want to tell the instructor, I didn't do anything you said, I just landed it. But I thought I had learned if he's happy with what you did, then just do it again. Don't get into details about him with him, you know? So I just kept doing what, what he was happy with, but I didn't follow all the rote method of landing an airplane. And when I became an instructor, I took the same approach to me because I realized, with me, I realized you don't land airplanes mechanically. It doesn't work that way. And that's the way most people try to teach somebody to land an airplane to begin with. Students actually can see what's happening. They can feel what's happening. If you ask them to see it and feel it, you have to see and feel in order to land the airplane. So I would teach students that way. And I think I, I usually wound up with the students that were about to flunk out before they flunked them out. They gave them to me to take a shot at them. And I, I you know, I never lost any of them. Uh, so I think I was, I was pretty good at it. It's just, you know, I think all, a lot of that came from uh, flying parachutes and just being very comfortable, being able to see the changes in aim point and stuff like that. I came right back as an instructor in T-38s. I had an academic advisor at the Air Force Academy who had done that, except in T-33s. When he graduated from pilot training, he came back as a T-33 instructor pilot. And he said that was a good approach because you learn how to fly the airplane. And you, when you teach somebody how to fly an airplane, you have to know how to fly an airplane. And uh, so when you fly the rest of the airplanes, it'll ju just be a process of learning the airplane. You'll already know how to fly. And I found that to be true. After I taught the students how to fly a T-38, I taught a lot of different students, including a large number of foreign students. Um, so when you teach somebody whose original language is different to English and is not that accustomed to high technology, how to fly a T-38, that's a bit of a challenge. Of course, it's a lot of work on their part too. But um, then when I went on to fly the F-15 and F-16, just flying is a second nature. I, I like flying the, the T-38. My favorite airplane was the F-15. I flew the F-15 operationally. Um, the, the F-15 just has so many redundant systems. It has so much capability. And uh, when it came out, it just had such a performance advantage over everybody else that um, it was almost like cheating. I mean, we, we, we had such an advantage. The question was whether, not whether or not you could beat other airplanes. The question was how many other airplanes at the same time could you defeat? And um, so an F-15 has never actually been defeated in combat. Another airplane has never shot down an F-15. So they've done an amazing job. The, the fellows that, that uh, men and women who followed in our footsteps have uh, certainly performed well in that airplane. It is so, um, has so many redundant systems, it can take a lot of, a lot of hits and still come back. Uh, there was a case of a foreign country that uh, wound up with an F-15 that got a lot of shots from a MiG, and uh, it, it came back. I, I, I mean, I, I think of the, and, and then another F-15 driver came along and shot the MiG off, off his tail. But I always felt sorry for that MiG driver because he had worked so hard and put so many bullets in the airplane and it wouldn't come down. You must have been incredibly frustrated. <laughs> and um, so, you, so you, you know, it's just an amazing airplane. There was another one, a Foreign Service flying an F-15, was involved in a midair. Essentially, the left wing was knocked off from the wing route outside, and uh, the pilot was able to fly it back and land it. He said after he landed that had he, had he seen how badly it was damaged, he would have ejected. 
He didn't know, he couldn't see how badly it was damaged from the cockpit, so he flew it back and landed. Absolutely amazing. So you had the idea when you were flying the F-15 that it was gonna bring you home. I mean, it was just an incredible airplane. It's a relatively big airplane, and um, other pilots used to tease us when it first came out that it was, they would call it the aluminum overcast because it was so big, or the flying cloud, or something like that. And I told him, I said, well, well, that's good. I said, because by day two, three of the war, the enemy will know when they see an F-15, the only way to survive is to run. Okay, they, they, it's good that they will see us because they will run, because they will know the alternative is being shot down. And that's exactly what happened in the first Gulf War. By day two or three of the war, you recall, the Iraqi aircraft were running to Iran. They were running, literally trying to fly away because they knew if you, if you face up against an F-15, you'll, um, you'll be shot down. So it was, it's, so yeah, I love the F-15. I just had um, felt comfortable enough financially to have a model uh, specially built for me. Uh, when I was at Holloman, the, the F-15s were coming off the line at McDonnell Douglas in, in uh, St. Louis. And so I actually got to go up and pick the, and, and fly the F-15 that was assigned to me back 77048, it was a great jet. And uh, so I, I now have a model of being shipped to me of 77048 with my name on it. I named the airplane uh, the Intrepid. Uh, it, uh, you know, that's a famous Navy name, but I thought it was a really good name. So I sucked it up and, um, and, uh, and, and named my airplane that. I think it's just a great name for it. And um, it was a great jet. I had a great set of crew chiefs. It was, uh, it was often wing high flyer. It was probably wing high flyer a third of the time. It was a great jet. So where yeah. did you uh, operationally fly that at? I, I flew it out of Holloman yep, in New Mexico. And, and like you say, some of the planes have gotten smaller. F-16 smaller, no. you know, F-22 smaller, F-35 smaller. What do you think about those technologies? And, and uh, what would you give to fly an F-35 or an F-22 right now? I'd, I'd love to fly an F-22. So the F-22 is really the follow-on to the F-15. It's similar in size to, to, to the F-15, but it's a much more integrated airplane. Um, so I, 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 I don't want to say too much about the airplane. I don't know, uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's an amazing airplane. I know that it has a greater performance advantage over airplanes today than we had when we came in with the F-15. And you got the so, thrust vectoring with the 22. And that's kind of you, you, you have thrust vectoring, you have very highly integrated avionics, you have um, stealth technology, um, you've got a lot going on uh, in, in that airplane. And so once again, you're back to the idea that flying the airplane is a very small segment of what you do. What you're doing is man managing a weapon system. And in the F-22, you have the opportunity to manage more, it has so much capability it, it, that you want to transfer capability from that airplane to other airplanes, F-15s, F-16s in the area. That's what you do as an F-15 pilot. So it, it has capability far out of proportion to its size. I just wish we had built a, a whole lot more of them. Can lead me into uh, your selection for uh, being an astronaut and joining NASA and all that. Uh, what was that process like, the selection process? and then? Uh... Tell me a little bit about your start with that. So, um, so I applied for the NASA program when I was a test pilot at Edwards. I assumed that I would apply and probably be turned down and apply again. Most people that got into the program had applied more than one time. And so I assumed that would happen. I remember when I went out for the interview, my wife said, well, what if you don't get selected? And I said, this is just round one. I'm, I'm in this for the, for, the, for the whole time, you know. I said, this is just round one. I wound up getting selected the first time, which was a little bit different. But um, the, the process, you had to go through two selections. First, you had to apply to the Air Force. And then the Air Force uh, formed a selection board, had a Brigadier General chair it, and they downsized, and they only forwarded so many names from the Air Force to NASA. Then NASA looked at those names, and they... Um, selected a group, uh, several groups, about seven different groups to come out and spend a week at the Johnson Space Center for interviews and physicals and things of that sort. And in reality, you were being interviewed the whole time, right? Everybody you interfaced out there with you was, um, was encouraged to give feedback on, on uh, so if you thought you were just gonna behave really well in front of the interview itself and then be a jerk the rest of the time, 
you'd be toast, okay? So they figure out uh, what type of person you were when you were out there. It was a week-long interview. And um, the whole process from filling out the initial set of forms, by the way, the initial set of forms were, um, I think, 18, 20 pages or whatever. This is before the days of word processors. So um, my, I had a wonderful um, secretary who typed all that stuff out for me. And I went out and got her a vase with 24 white roses after she finished. And when I got selected, I went and, you know, gave her a big thank you hug. Yeah, because um, she was, and, and she was receptive to receiving a thank you hug. And, um, but, uh, and I told her, I said, you had a lot to do with me getting selected because there's no way I could have filled out those 20 some pages. And, um, so she did. A great, so it lasted a year. I think I applied sometime in the springtime and didn't find out I was selected till the following spring. And um, the word was that if you got a call from George Abbey or John Young, George Abbey was head of flight crew operations and um, and John Young was head of the astronaut office. The word was that if you got a call from them, you had been selected. If you got a call from somebody else, you hadn't been selected. So um, I was actually home at lunch and my neighbor who hadn't applied was coming home as I was going back to work. And he said, Sid, they're making the announcements. So you've, uh, you, you know, and I was like, wow, I'll find out when I arrive at the office, I'll know based on who called me. So I, I walked into the office and, and my secretary was there and she was said, Sid, good news, you got a call from so-and-so at NASA. And it was not John Young or Jo or uh, George Abbey, and I was like, oh. And she said, this is great, and I was like, oh, yeah. And so I tried to put the best face on it. I didn't want her to know that she was giving me extremely bad news. She was excited, and I was actually scheduled to fly a proficiency flight in an F-16 that afternoon. And so I thought, you know, this is bad news. Well, I'll just go out and fly the flight. I'll call the guy back after it's over. I literally had my, my harness on, my helmet. I'm walking out to the airplane. And I thought, you know, this guy has a horrible job. Nobody wants to hear from him, right? Everybody knows when, when he calls them, it's like, yeah, oh, bad news. So I was like, okay, I'll do him a favor. I'll call him back. So I called back and he answers the phone and I'm like, you know, I'm returning your call. And he's like, yeah. And he starts beating around the bush, talking about the weather, talking about everything else. And, and I'm just like, get it over with, okay? I know I didn't get selected, just get it over with. And after a while he says, you're probably wondering why I'm beating around the bush. And I'm like, actually, I am. <laughs> you know? And he said, that's because I'm calling for George Abbey. He wants to talk to you. I'm like, oh, that's different, okay? So he said, uh, you know, he's busy right now, but can he call you back? And I'm like, absolutely. He said, what number will you be at? I said, I'll be at this number. It was the old days of push button numbers on the phone. And you also had one button where you could push an intercom you know, broadcast to everybody in the building. So I gave him a number and then I pushed the intercom button and I said, nobody get on 2856 or whatever it was. I said, I'm expecting a call in 2856. Nobody use 2856, okay. <laughs> and then I sat there and waited for it and got the call, which was, which was uh, very, very good news. And um, so I was excited and then, you know, got, got to head out for the space program. Awesome. What was the first thing you did? Did you call your wife or? Yeah, yeah, I, I called her up. And uh, that, that night I remember telling her, well, how does it feel being married to an astronaut? And she said, don't let it go to your head. <laughs> she was like, you, you haven't changed. She sees that as, she's seen that as her job throughout my career to make sure I keep my feet planted. It's, it's like, and I tell people, you know, they would say, you know, what's it like being an astronaut? I said, you still have to take the garbage out, you know? You still have to take the trash out and all that sort of stuff. None of that stuff changes. And I realize now, um, I'm glad I did all that because, um, you know, looking back on it, the most important thing you do in your life, if I had not been an astronaut, somebody else would have been an astronaut, okay? Somebody else would have done the things I did, maybe a little different or something or other. I would like to think I did a really good job, but somebody else would have done them, you know, and, and, and the program would have done well and everything. But the difference you make in life are the people you interface with, your spouse your children, your siblings. The, those are the people that you leave a true mark on in life. And so, you know, that's what, I'm, I'm glad I never forgot about that. And that's a tribute to my wife, 
Mary Ann, the fact that she never let me forget about the family that was home when I was off flying F-15s or F-16s or space shuttles or whatever. She, she always, she never let me forget who was at home. A couple years ago, uh, I got to take uh, three of my grandkids out to see the Endeavor in California. And um, it, was, it was bigger than I remembered it. So I, I, was, I was impressed when I was looking at it, I was impressed with it. But they never got a chance to go up and look in the cockpit, see the switches, see the, the mid deck, see the flight deck. Uh, where the pilot and commander sit, where the mission specialists work, uh, the, uh, the space toilet, things like that. So um, this is, uh, having, having this training artifact is great because this is the same thing we trained on as astronauts. It's great for people to be able to see where, this, where the astronauts lived, where they worked, what they had to do to fly the space shuttle. So, so I think it's wonderful. I'd like to uh, be able to bring, bring my grandkids here uh, so that they can actually see what it was like inside. They just got to see, see the endeavor from the outside. They didn't get to see the inside of it.